today we're going to be talking about basic evaluation of the dementia patient. This program is designed for primary care providers who will be examining patients complaining of cognitive impairment. It is not meant to explain a complicated, sophisticated evaluation, but rather a basic uh, bare bones assessment that can be done as an outpatient. Let's begin by reviewing the objectives of this program. Number one, we want to describe a minimum comprehensive assessment for the typical de patient, dementia patient in an outpatient setting. Number two, we want to describe the components of a clinical history for dementia. That's very important because the clinical history provides valuable clues. Number three, we want to explain the role of the general physical and neurological assessment uh, in the dementia patient. Uh, these are important in excluding physical causes. Number four, we want to describe basic laboratory tests that should be ordered on pretty much every patient. Number five, we want to explain the role of brain imaging uh, and dementia, a very controversial area. Number six, we want to enlist important information to provide fa families following the diagnosis of dementia because the families have to be included in this process. And then number seven, we wanted to briefly discuss the types of follow-up studies and, and the periods of follow-up that ought to be carried out in a patient with dementia. To begin with, it's important to remember a few general principles when approaching a patient who comes into your office with a complaint of cognitive impairment. Remember that of a hundred patients who walk into your office complaining of forgetfulness, over 20% 20, 20 of them, 20 in fact, will have some treatable or reversible illness. The other 80%, unfortunately, will have some permanent, fixed, probably progressive disorder. The assessment is most important for those 20 patients whom you can fix or significantly help. When you're getting the history and the phys doing the physical on these patients, it's important to keep a few things in mind. First of all, you have to be systematic. Make sure you go through all of the parts of the assessment. Secondly, try to use several observers. Remember, the patient may be forgetful and cannot remember that they're having these difficulties. You may want to talk to the one or two family members who know the patient particularly well. Thirdly, from the conceptual basis, you may want to divide the symptoms into cognitive and psychiatric because on the other side of this, the management standpoint, you're going to treat cognitive and psychiatric symptoms differently. And fourthly, you need to devote at least 20 to 30 minutes to gathering the history and another 20 to 30 minutes to doing the examination. So in total, it's going to take you about an hour to do a good, careful assessment of a patient who complains of dementia. What is the minimum dementia assessment? Well, for, there are five parts to it. First of all, you have to do a careful clinical history, and we're going to go through that in just a second. Then you have to do a thorough mental status examination because it is the mental, mental status exam that is pivotal in the diagnosis. Next, you need to perform a physical examination to exclude physical causes of confusion. Next, you need to do a neurological evaluation. Like the physical, it will exclude some uh, physical causes of uh, confusion, and it will also provide you with some clues as to the type of dementia the patient might have. And lastly, there are certain laboratory tests that need to be done in every patient with dementia to exclude treatable disorders like vitamin de deficiencies or thyroid disorder. When you are sitting down with the patient and the family caregiver or the patient and the historian, you need to pull out certain facts in a systematic way to understand the nature of the disease. The first thing that you want to know is when did you first see the onset of symptoms or deficits? If the patient has only been confused for uh, days or weeks, then this may simply be delirium or depression. On the other hand, if the family member tells you, yeah, he's been forgetful for several years, but it's gotten worse lately, that's more suggestive of dementia. The second thing is that you want to identify the sequence of deficits or symptoms. It's very common in Alzheimer's disease to have memory impairment first, which the patients oftentimes cover up. And then as the disease progresses, the patient may develop problems with language or performing complicated motor skills like activities of daily living. 
Psychiatric symptoms can also come on. It's relatively uncommon to see the psychiatric symptoms first, although that does occur. So, for instance, if the family says to you, well, you know, he got depressed and then he got forgetful, you might want to think more about pseudo-dementia, that is, dementia associated with depression, rather than with Alzheimer's disease. The next thing you want to do is you want to identify the rate and pattern of progression of symptoms. Alzheimer's disease and most other types of dementia progress relatively slowly over a two to three to five year period. Usually the families will say, well, three or four years ago he was a little forgetful and then a couple years ago he couldn't do his checkbook anymore and then last year we realized that he wasn't paying the bills uh, and sometimes he'd leave the gas on in the house. That kind of slow, steady progression of symptoms is typical of Alzheimer's disease. Fluctuation of symptoms is very important. Some patients, as they progress in their illness, will be uh, relatively clear in the morning and confused in the afternoon. That's called sundowning. So in addition to asking the family when did the symptoms come on and how rapidly did they progress, you would also want to find out whether or not the symptoms wax and wane. The symptoms of most dementias are relatively uh, consistent and fixed. If there are big variations like one week he'll be really good and the next week he'll be terribly confused and can't even dress himself, you would wonder if the patient might have delirium in addition to dementia. Likewise, there are some other types of dementia, like diffuse Lewy body disease, in which fluctuation of the symptoms is fairly common. The next piece of history you want to pull out is whether or not there's any relationship to medical or neurological illnesses. If the family comes in and says to you, well, he was fine until he had his surgery and he lost a lot of blood, and then when he woke up, he wasn't his same self, or he was fine until he had that big stroke and ever since then he's been confused, you might want to infer that this is not Alzheimer's disease, but perhaps post-anoxia uh, post, uh, dementia, that is, uh, dementia following low oxygen to the brain, or it may be vascular dementia, that is, dementia caused by multiple strokes. And then finally, you want to ask whether or not anything has been done for this. Uh, for instance, uh, if the patient uh, was confused and was placed on an antidepressant and got a lot better, and then when they stopped the medicine, he got confused again, that would suggest that perhaps the patient may have dementia associated with depression. Likewise, if they say, well, he was perfectly fine until the doctor put him on that depression medicine called Elevil, and now he seems really confused, it may be that this is actually a medically induced delirium. So in summary, what you need to do is very carefully detail and catalog the type and sequence of symptoms that occur in the patient. That's why it's so important to get a uh, second person in there to help you with the history. The next thing you need to do is to move on to the past medical history. Many types of cognitive impairment result from injuries to the brain. So for instance in the past medical history you'd want to know whether or not the patient had had strokes. That would lead you more in the direction of vascular dementia. You'd want to know whether or not the patient had severe cardiovascular disease. If, for instance, the patient had a lot of difficulties with cardiac arrhythmias, irregular beats of the heart, then that may contribute to poor perfusion of the head, and that would lead you more along the line of vascular dementia rather than Alzheimer's disease. If they tell you that the patient was fine until they were in a motor vehicle accident, and after they woke up from a four or five day coma, they were much more confused and forgetful, that would lead you to believe that this was dementia following head injury. Seizures is important because most types of dementia also have seizures associated with them and you need to know that if you're going to be managing the patient. And recent surgeries. That's pretty important because patients who are, are mildly demented oftentimes become a lot worse following a general anesthetic. On the other hand, if the patient was perfectly fine until they had the surgery, you would worry that perhaps some complication of the surgery or some medication that they have received following the surgery may be contributing to their uh, intellectual or cognitive impairment. The next thing you need to do is you need to get a complete list of prescribed and over-the-counter medications. And here, uh, when we're dealing with the elderly, you should expect to see what is called a positive shopping bag sign. 
That means that the patient should come in with literally a shopping bag full of medications because most elders are on numerous drugs and they literally have to bring every one of them in for you to inspect so you'll know the complete range of both prescribed and over-the-counter medications. When your office staff is telling these patients to come in for their evaluation, make sure they emphasize that everything that goes in the patient's mouth has to go into the bag so that you can see all of the different psychoactive medications that the patient's receiving. Oftentimes people do not understand that prescribed medications like antihistamines and over-the-counter sleep preparations can have a profound confusing effect in elderly patients, especially those with pre-existing brain injury. Newer discoveries uh, on Alzheimer's disease indicate that estrogen and non anti-inflammatories may play some protective role uh, in slowing or protecting against the onset of the symptoms of only Alzheimer's disease. So consequently, make sure you know about estrogen replacement and non anti-inflammatory drug usage. The third thing that you have to do when you're talking about past medical history is to get a past psychiatric history. Uh, patients, especially older people, are particularly careful about what they tell the doctor about past psychiatric diseases because the elderly see them as such severely stigmatized illnesses. Uh, you need to ask specifically about depression. You need to ask about drinking patterns because uh, alcohol abuse is as common in the elderly as it is in the general population and elders oftentimes hide it. Unrecognized substance abuse can cause confusion. It can also lead to dementia and it can complicate your management of this patient. Uh, you need to ask whether or not the patient has ever had any previous psychiatric treatment uh, and specifically what kind of treatment and what was the diagnosis. And finally it's important to ask whether or not the patient has received psychotropic medications in the past and whether or not they're sensitive to them. Oftentimes the families can tell you, yeah, the doctor put the, my uh, father on Ativan and he got really confused. Those pieces of information are very helpful when you're considering a management strategy after the evaluation. So what is the absolute minimum clinical history that you have to uh, obtain? Well, first of all, you have to get that history of present illness. And secondly, you have to get the past medical history. But you also have to get a social history and a family history. The family history is important because many types of dementia are now uh, uh, being recognized as inheritable, especially Alzheimer's disease. Oftentimes the families don't know that the, their loved ones in the past had had Alzheimer's disease. and in, in many instances they were classified as, quotes, hardening of the arteries, which really is vascular dementia. But it's important to ask about uh, older family members, especially parents who have died. You want to know whether or not they became forgetful as they grew older and how old they were when they became forgetful. You won't necessarily expect them uh, to offer you the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease because the diagnosis really wasn't made until the late 70s and the early 80s. It's also important to ask whether or not there's a family history of mental illness because if the uh, patient has several family members with depression, it increases their risk for also developing depression. Now sometimes they won't tell you these things that went on in the family, so sometimes you have to be a little bit sneaky about it and ask, for instance, whether or not the patient was ever hospitalized for nerves or whether or not they had to stay at the state hospital. Uh, family members are oftentimes hesitant to uh, tell physicians that they have had other family members who wound up uh, institutionalized. And likewise, you need to ask about suicide as an indicator of depression. People oftentimes don't think that suicide is a sign of depression and then sometimes you'll be surprised that when you ask about depression they say no no one everybody no one in the family ever had it but then when you ask about suicide they say yes my brother took his life when you're talking about family history uh, of dementia then you need to you need to nail down for each family member the age of onset how long they were demented for the types of symptoms that they manifested, and what was the diagnosis that was provided to the family. This is important because predicting risk for Alzheimer's disease is pegged on how many family members you have with the disease and how early they got it in their life. So for instance, if you have 
an elderly aunt who got Alzheimer's disease uh, when she was uh, 80, your risk for developing the dementia is no greater than that of anybody else. On the other hand, if you, both your mother and your father got Alzheimer's disease at age 61 or 62, your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease is significantly greater than that of the general population. Getting these particulars of the family history is very important in attempting to assess the relative risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Other types of dementia, such as vascular disease, alcohol-induced, diffuse Lewy body disease, do not have the very powerful family component that Alzheimer's disease has. Now we're going to move on, since you've completed your history, to the mental status examination. There are several components to a basic mental status examination. First of all, you have to assure that the patient is sensorially com uh, competent, that is, that the patient can hear and see adequately for an examination. You need to do a psychological assessment to determine their state of mind. You need to do a cognitive screening, and you need to do behavioral observations while you're doing all of this to see how the patient acts and behaves. This form, which is rather lengthy, demonstrates the standardized geriatric mental status examination that we perform on all of our patients. And it is avail available in the packet that comes with this tape. There are several major categories that we're going to go through. To begin with, before you start doing a mental status examination, you need to make sure that the patient can hear and see. A simple test for patient hearing is just ask them to repeat, say, A, B, C, D. Oftentimes, we add, before uh, we uh, confront them with that, we will turn our face and say, can you say A, B, C, D? That prevents patients who are lip reading from reading your lips and makes them actually listen to what you're saying. Our sequence of events is that we turn our head and give them a task. If they can't hear it, then we face them and repeat the same phrase or numbers or letters and ask them to repeat it. If they still can't hear what you're saying, then we tend to raise our voice loudly and see if by finding their good ear and speaking loudly they can hear what we're saying. If they still can't hear you, then the probability is that your mental status examination is going to be severely affected by the patient's hearing impairment. Hearing impaired patients oftentimes deny the fact that they are hard of hearing. Uh, oftentimes they will show up at the assessment without their hearing aids in, or if the hearing aid is in, they don't have the batteries in the hearing aid so it's not working properly. These are all important things in making sure you know exactly how well the patient's cognitive function is. The second thing we test for is eyesight, because some of the uh, mental status tests on the Folstein mini mental status exam require intact eyesight. We just generally ask them to identify how many fingers we're holding up, one, two or one. If Generally, if they can identify fingers, then we, we feel that they can probably see well enough to proceed with the examination. The next step is that we determine whether or not they are, their language skills are intact. The language assessment will be explained a little bit later in the program, uh, and then we proceed into the uh, psychological assessment. The psychological assessment, as a minimum, screens for, number one, depression, number two, psychosis, and number three, risk uh, for harm to self or others. We've talked at length in the depression segment uh, about uh, ways of assessing for depression, and that's not going to be repeated here. Psychosis is very important, to deter and oftentimes patients are hesitant to tell you whether or not, for instance, they're... Uh, experiencing auditory or visual hallucinations or whether or not they're delusional. The family can oftentimes tell you whether or not they have false beliefs. Uh, on the other hand, hallucinations are sometimes more difficult to elicit. If the patient is responding to visual stimuli in, in, in the room that aren't there, then you know that the patient is probably uh, experiencing visual hallucinations. So for instance, if the patient is picking at things, you know that they probably are having visual hallucinations. Auditory hallucinations are a little bit more difficult to elicit. Oftentimes what we'll do is we'll begin by asking the patient whether or not their ears are playing tricks on them, whether or not sometimes they hear unusual sounds that other people can't hear.
we reassure them that that happens sometimes as you get older. If they endorse that symptom, then we ask more specifics, like, for instance, what sort of things are their sounds or voices saying to them? Do they say thinning or unpleasant things? This gives you some insight as to whether or not the patient is experiencing hallucinations and in the intensity and severity of the hallucinations. Next, we, we're going to uh, discuss the cognitive screen. And the cognitive screen that we use is the Folstein Mini Mental Status Examination. The Mini Mental Status is a method of grading cognitive aspects of mental functions. The advantages of using the Folstein Mini Mental is that, first of all, that it's reliable, that if you have several people in your office that are using it, once they're all trained, you should pretty much get the same scores. It is valid. We know that it works well in the elderly, and it also works in mentally ill people. So, for instance, if the patient has schizophrenia or a history of depression, it is still an effective uh, screen for cognitive impairment. Uh, and it has been normed. It's got published data. Many researchers have used it. And, in fact, it's been used in other studies, uh, such as predicting uh, ability to drive and predicting ability to give informed consent. Some of the basic principles for conducting a, a, a mini mental status examination that, may, that assures that your patient is going to perform the best that they can is, first of all, make the patient comfortable. Nobody likes to be put through mental gymnastics, especially if you're suffering from dementia. Make sure that it's done in a calm, quiet environment. Don't do it in the middle of a nursing home dairy area because the patient is going to be distracted. And if they have some mild hearing impairment, the ambient noise is going to impair their ability to understand what you're saying. The next thing is establish a rapport. We tend to not just hop right into the mini mental because the patients oftentimes feel like they're being put on the spot, especially if they're somewhat paranoid and delusional. They will think you're trying to do something to them. So we tend to chat with them a little bit before we do the test. And, uh, we make sure, uh, as we told you earlier, that they can hear and see okay. The test is not valid in people with severe hearing or visual impairments. The uh, fourth thing is you have to remember that this test uh, must be given as it is written. There is no prompting or helping. If you do that, then it invalidates the test results. But it is okay to praise success, to reassure the patient, to tell them everything is okay and that they're doing great. This is an example of the Folstein Mini Mental Status Examination. This is the basic cognitive screen that is routinely used in many clinics to determine whether or not a patient is demonstrating evidence of dementia. It is actually a Whitman sampler of neuropsychological function. As you can see, there are broad categories of testing areas. For instance, you check orientation for the patient. Registration is whether or not you can get a patient's attention uh, long enough uh, to uh, retain uh, three pieces of information. Then there is the attention, attention and calculation component where you ask them to do mental gymnastics such as spelling a word backwards like world or counting backwards from 100 by sevens. Then there is the recall segment where you ask them to remember uh, those three things that you told them just five minutes ago. And then there was the language component where you ask them to name things, where you ask them to repeat things, and you ask them to, to carry out a three-step command. There is also a test on here for visual spatial abilities uh, in asking them to copy the interlocking pentagram. It's important to emphasize that this is just a basic screen. It's not meant to replace uh, complex neuropsychological testing. However, the reality is that in most locations, neuropsychological assessments are not available or not financially feasible. The scoring of the Folstein Mini Mental uh, is as follows. 26 to 30 in a patient who is literate is considered to be normal. 20 to tw 21 to 25 is considered to be abnormal, but in the gray zone between being cognitively intact and being demented. 20 and below is considered to be indicative of dementia, with 16 to 20 being mild, 11 to 15 being moderate, and 10 and below being severe.
the scores for patients who lack the ability to read and write, and oftentimes we see individuals, even though they're very intelligent, who never had the opportunity to go to school, those scores are posted on the right and are reduced accordingly. The Folstein Mini Mental Status Examination is a clean, easy instrument that can be uh, executed by social workers or nurses and provides a wealth of valuable information. It's helpful, first of all, in establishing a baseline so that you know where the patient is cognitively. Secondly, it's, it's helpful in, in charting the course of the dementia. We know that patients will lose points on the score over time. The average loss of points in a dementia patient is between two and three. If the patient over a one-year period, instead of losing two or three, loses six or eight, then you need to begin to look for some other disease process that may have caused a precipitous drop in the score. Likewise, if you're not sure whether or not the patient may have new onset confusion, this test is helpful, especially if you had baseline values. It tells you whether or not, for instance, the patient may be demonstrating symptoms of delirium, which is an abrupt onset cognitive impairment. These test values are also helpful in assessing for things like competence. We know that patients who score below 15 are probably incapable of giving informed consent for either legal or medical purposes. And these test scores are also being used to identify candidates for new medications for Alzheimer's disease. So for instance, patients uh, with Alzheimer's disease who score 15 and above are good candidates for the new medication Aricept, a drug that increases acetylcholine. Between 10 and 15, we're not completely sure how beneficial a drug is going to be. And in general, you shouldn't give these drugs to patients who score below a mini mental of 10 because it's not going to help. So consequently, the mini mental status examination score can be used in a wide range of areas that's helpful both to the family and to the clinical management team. Language assessment is very important in any mental status examination. Later in the programs, you're going to hear about the four A's of Alzheimer's disease, which is amnesia, uh, which is memory problems, aphasia, which is language problems, apraxia, which is motor skill problems, and agnosia, which is recognition. Language assessment helps you understand whether or not the patient has the second A, which is aphasia. When you're testing somebody's language skills, uh, you want to look both at their receptive ability, that is whether or not they can understand what's being said, and their expressive ability. The expressive ability uh, is usually uh, determined during the course of the interview. If the patient is able to find the right word, if the patient is able to speak in paragraphs, if their speech makes sense, then you're relatively assured that their expressive abilities remain intact. Receptive function, however, is a little bit trickier. And remember, these two uh, brain functions are located in different areas of the brain. If you uh, remember from part two of this series, uh, expressive ability is in the frontal lobe. Receptive ability is primarily in the temporal lobe. We screen patients for receptive language skills by a two-step method. We start off with a simple story repetition, uh, and it's called a milk story. Two men get in a car and drive to the store. They buy a bottle of milk for breakfast. Then we ask the patient to repeat that story back to us. If they're having trouble, then we just ask them, how many men? Where did they go? What did they buy? What meal was it for? There are four basic pieces of information in that story. If the patient is unable to get the milk story, then we ask for an even simpler uh, command. Like, for instance, we may ask the patient to put their hand on their head. If they're unable to do that, then we know that they have really significant language impairment. On the other hand, if they can put their hand on their head but can't do the milk story, they also have significant impairment, but probably you can communicate with them. If they do okay on the milk story, then we move on to a more complicated story about a cowboy. Now, this cowboy goes to town to buy a new set of clothes. He leaves his dog at the ranch to guard the house. Well, he goes to town and changes into his new clothes, but when he returns, the dog growls at him. 
Well, the cowboy changes back into his dirty old clothes. Now the dog greets him like an old friend. Now that's a very complicated story, and it not only has parts that need to be repeated to you, but it's also inferential. So we go back and we ask the patient to either repeat the story, and they need to get all of the parts, or if they're fumbling with it, we ask them specific questions. Where did the cowboy go? What did he buy? What happened when he returned? How did he keep the dog from growling at him? Remember, we don't tell him exactly how it is that he qu had the dog to stop growling at him. That is inferred from the story and requires fairly sophisticated language skills. If the patient is able to get the, both the milk story and the cowboy story without difficulty, then we infer that their language skills are relatively intact. The cowboy story, by the way, is part of a standardized language screening instrument that has been published in the past. Once you have assessed then their basic cognitive skills and uh, their language skills, then you need to go on and look at things like activity of daily living, which is basically an assessment of what's called praxis. Uh, and remember that pra praxis, motor skills, uh, are unlike uh, language and memory, are programmed primarily in the parietal lobe. In order to accomplish that, we use what's called the Psychogeriatric Dependency Rating Scale, the PGDRS. And it is, it's a method of, using, of assessment using uh, dependency uh, and nursing time. That means how much nursing time is it going to take to keep this patient uh, active. The major roles of the PGDRS is that it gives you a snapshot view of patient problems. It also helps you over a period of time evaluate whether or not there's been any change or not. In addition to that, it assesses the need for services. High PGDRS scores are predictive of high needs for supportive services. And in fact, if it's a very high score, that patient is probably going to be, need, be needing the services of a geriatric inpatient unit. It also provides a model for decision making with regards to quality of care for the patient. The PGDRS has three major areas. The beauty of the PGDRS is it can be done in about 10 or 15 minutes uh, and it does not require a high degree of skill but provides all of the basic information that you need to know about function in the patient. These three areas include a nonverbal orientation scale, a behavior scale, and a physical activity or capacity scale referred to as ADLs. The advantages of using the PGDRS is first of all it's very easy to use, secondly it's brief, it's only one page, and therefore it doesn't cost a lot of money to do, and you can evaluate uncooperative or mute patients with this instrument. A few uh, principles to keep in mind when you're doing a PGDRS. First of all, this instrument is used to assess patient function based on caregiver or staff observations. So what you do is you go in with this one sheet of paper and ask caregivers or staff whether or not patients can do specific things. That implies that they are familiar with the patient. The other thing is that before you do a PGDRS, you need to make sure that the patient has settled into whatever unit or living location that they're in. When in doubt, you can always test the patient to see what their level of function is. In other words, if they're not sure whether or not the patient can do a certain thing, you can always go and observe to see whether they can or not. Uh, and remember, there's only one score per behavior. This is an example of a PGDRS. You have a copy of this. In your, uh, in your handout that goes along with this tape. You can th see the three broad areas, orientation, behavior, and, and uh, physical uh, or activities of daily living assistance. The behavior categories here encompass all of the major behaviors that you should ask about in a dementia patient. The ADL scores cover all of the major ADL functions. You can see that the scoring methodology is, is present on the form. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time in this segment 
to explain all of, all of the particulars of doing a PGDRS. Although written instructions are available, they're pretty easy to follow and routinely uh, both professionals and trained non-professionals can execute this instrument with relatively high accuracy. Interpreting the PGDRS uh, is simple. The higher the score, the higher the need for nursing care. Likewise, this is a valuable part of your dementia diagnosis. If you're asking, for instance, under the ADL score, whether the patient can feed themselves, dress themselves, bathe themselves, and uh, shave themselves or self-groom, and they have forgotten how to do that, that is evidence of apraxia whether it be a feeding apraxia or a bathing apraxia or a shaving apraxia. So it gives valuable cognitive as well as behavioral uh, information. Next comes the physical examination. The physical examination is important because patients may have physical ailments that may cause the patient uh, to appear demented. So for instance, if the patient has evidence of a malignancy or has severe COPD. If the patient has a severe arrhythmia that can be detected on auscultation of the chest, these are all valuable pieces of information that you can use in, in composing a total picture of this patient. Neurological examination is also important. Most forms of dementia do not have, for instance, abnormalities of cranial nerve function. So, for instance, a patient with Alzheimer's disease should have relatively intact cranial nerve function. If they have a facial droop, then you would wonder if perhaps they had had a stroke, and that might make you think more in terms of vascular dementia. Motor system examination is important because Alzheimer patients should have a relatively intact motor system, good normal symmetrical strength. Weakness suggests some other abnormality, such as vascular dementia. Sensory system, patients with Alzheimer's disease and most other types of dementia should have an intact sensory examination as well as intact reflexes. Loss of reflexes and decreased sensation makes you uh, concerned that perhaps there may be some toxic process such as alcoholism. Coordination and gait likewise is usually retained in most dementia until end stage. So for instance if the patient is very uh, ataxic you would wonder if perhaps some other physical problem has not occurred or if perhaps the patient may suffer from alcoholism, which commonly has cerebellar injury associated with it. When you're looking at the results of the neurological examination, there are several valuable pieces of information that can be used in trying to differentiate between the different types of dementia. For instance, Alzheimer's disease rarely has focal deficits associated with it. If you see focal deficits, uh, weakness in one side, facial droop, upgoing toe, that sort of thing. You should think of things perhaps like vascular dementia. There are some uh, neurological signs that are present across the board with regards to dementia. For instance, frontal release signs. A frontal release, uh, a good example is the grasp response where patients can grasp onto things and won't let go. That type of response is a frontal uh, lobe sign and it's typical in most types of dementia. Extrapyramidal symptoms such as stiffness, rigidity, slow gait, difficulty on arising can be seen in Parkinson's disease, but it can also be seen in diffuse Lewy body disease. Sensory deficits such as uh, decreased sensation in the stocking glove distribution over the extremities is typical of a peripheral neuropathy and can be seen in certain toxic disorders such as lead intoxication, but more commonly is associated with alcohol. Likewise, abnormalities of gait and coordination, especially in the earlier phases of the disease, are atypical for Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, but are typically found in alcohol. So consequently, the, the neurological examination can help you in distinguishing amongst some of the different types of dementia. The minimum medical evaluation for a dementia patient includes a, a complete blood count with a differential to see if the patient is anemic or megaloblastic as you sometimes see in B12 or folate deficiency, an SMA18 to make sure that the patient doesn't have uremia or hypocalcemia leading to confusion based on metabolic derangement, thyroid studies because 
hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism can sometimes lead to confusion and can be confused with dementia. B12 and folate levels are standard tests in all dementia evaluation. Some patients just simply malabsorb B12. You need to test that. Uh, a urinalysis, uh, especially to make sure that the patient doesn't have a urinary tract infection. An electrocardiogram to make sure that the patient does not have uh, cardiovascular disease, especially arrhythmias. Uh, arrhythmias can predispose to embolization and multiple strokes. Likewise, it may play some role in uh, your choice of medications in the future. And a CT of the head, a basic non-enhanced CT to exclude things like subdural hematomas, mass lesions, and to assess for atrophy. It's important uh, to remember, however, that you do not diagnose dementia with a CT of the head or with these blood tests. You diagnose dementia with a good clinical history and a good mental status examination. There are some optional tests that some folks like to do. Neuropsychiatric testing is wonderful. Neuropsychologists can detail in great, uh, in great measure the uh, psycho neuropsychological deficits of the patients, and they're helpful in following the patients. Neuropsych testing is also helpful in teasing out certain types of dementia. Unfortunately, neuropsychiatric testing is hard to come by and is expensive, and so consequently, most primary care doctors do not order it. Serum or urine toxicology. If the patient is coming out of an outpatient setting and there's any question as to whether or not the patient may be abusing drugs uh, or prescription medications, you should order a serum and urine toxicology screen. Magnesium levels are often, sometimes helpful, especially in a history of alcoholism. Heavy metal screen, especially if the patient uh, had past exposure, was a painter. Uh, and MRIs are sometimes helpful if you're looking for specific kinds of pathology like white matter damage. However, in general, uh, CTs are relatively cost-effective in screening for basic brain pathology. What are some of the marginal tests that get ordered? Uh, the literature indicates that, the, that a spinal tap is of minimal value and provides little diagnostic information for dementia. Uh, brainwave tests, EEG, are uh, rarely helpful except in the case of delirium. Spec scans get a lot of play and have a, had a lot of literature. However, uh, their diagnostic accuracy in a patient lacking a good physical uh, and good uh, mental status examination is questionable. PET scanning is not readily available in most places, is expensive, and probably provides little information beyond that which would be obtained with a good clinical assessment. Dopplers of the carotid should not be done unless there is a clear indication for uh, artery, artery disease and vascular dementia. What are some of the clinical evaluations then that you uh, are uh, and their value in, in uh, common dementias? Well, this table demonstrates the fact that while there are many different tests that can be done, the two things that are of most value consistently across the board is the clinical history, the physical examination, and the neurological assessment. In all cases, those assessments are pivotal in the diagnosis of dementia. As seen in this graphic, other tests, or in the next graphic, these additional marginal tests are of limited value. They can be done at the discretion of the clinician. However, you must do a good clinical history and a good clinical, uh, physical, and neurological assessment to determine the diagnosis of dementia. Now today we've only really focused on the common dementias such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, diffuse uh, Lewy body disease, alcohol-induced uh, dementia. There are a variety of other dementias such as Creutzfeldt disease, which is the prion-mediated disorder, what is now called frontotemporal dementia, which is increasingly talked about, as well as disorders like normal pressure hydrocephalus and combined system atrophy. In fact, there is a lengthy list of disorders that cause cognitive impairment. If you know the basic clinical history and neurological and physical findings present in the four most common types of dementia, you will be able to diagnose and treat the vast majority of patients that come in to your primary care office. In trying to assess a patient, 
it's important that you use a team approach. Many of these tasks that we just outlined do not necessarily need to be performed by the physician. For instance, the clinical history can be obtained by either the uh, office nurse or if your uh, office has a social worker, by the uh, social worker. The neurological examination and the physical examination do need to be performed by either the physician or the nurse practitioner. A mental status examination can be performed by a properly trained registered nurse or a properly trained uh, social worker with advanced skills. And in fact, studies demonstrate that clinical nurse specialists who are properly trained have the same diagnostic skill in dementia as do physicians. The medical evaluation, that is the laboratory studies and the CAT scan, of course, need to be ordered and interpreted by either the physician or the nurse practitioner. On the other hand, family education can be accomplished by either the nurse or a social worker with proper training and appropriate materials. This evaluation is structured in such a way that facilities such as community mental health centers can uh, gather the clinical history, do the mental status examination, and perform the family education, and refer the patient to the local physician for a neurological, physical examination, and medical evaluation. In fact, most physicians like this kind of arrangement because uh, most physicians are not trained in doing mental status examinations and would prefer to have the history and the mental status examination performed by someone else. Finally, once you've made the diagnosis, it's important to go back and talk with the patient and with the family. The literature today indicates that the physician or the uh, clinician is under an obligation to inform the patient, as well as the family, of course, about the diagnosis. The patient has the right to hear it once. On the other hand, if they deal with it through denial, uh, it's okay to just move on to other things because there's lots of other things that need to be spoken about. First of all, family needs to be educated and they need to be provided with as much printed information as possible. They need extra copies so that they can give it to their relatives who are going to participate in caregiving. Families need to be encouraged to attend support groups. Support groups provide a valuable wealth of information as well as moral and spiritual support uh, in this process. Remember that the typical Alzheimer patient is going to live anywhere between seven and ten years and that the family is going to do probably between three and seven years of caregiving. There are resource listings that are available throughout the state, resources being things like adult daycare, dementia units, things like that, that should be made available to the family. And last but not least, follow-up visit. It's important to not make a diagnosis and then cut the family loose because these people are going to need a lot of assistance. Patients should be seen on a regular basis. They should not be uh, allowed to go for more than six months without a return visit, even if it's just to check and see whether or not they've developed any new psychiatric or behavioral problems. Likewise, it's worthwhile to repeat some parts of the mental status examination, such as the uh, Folstein Mini Mental Status, on a yearly basis. Most of the studies, such as the lab tests and the CAT scans, only need to be done once. But the cognitive problems and the psychiatric problems are going to evolve over time. And it's important to have a plan for dealing with them and to deal with them as they come up rather than waiting for them to become an emergency or a catastrophe. These are the kinds of things that you can do for patients and family caregivers who are caring for an individual with dementia. In summary then, a basic assessment can be accomplished on a patient with dementia in about 45 to 60 minutes. It requires a good, careful mental status examination as well as a thorough clinical history and ancillary studies. It can be performed by the general practitioner and with appropriate follow-up provides excellent care to both the dementia patient and the family caregivers who will be caring for them over the next 7 to 10 years.